Hello. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, we can talk in English. I Hello. think everybody here, <laughs> everybody here can. Uh, they have English lessons, so we, because Slovak schools are good. Huh? Uh, I have one question. Maybe it was already explained, but uh, what is your idea as how to improve this education, especially at colleges and uh, maybe also for the high school in general? Because you are giving questions, but maybe I'm missing some kind of uh, maybe some ideas how to go further, which which way to go. Thank you. Yes. Well, to go back to my slide on this, my number one answer is less, less money. Cut, 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 austerity. We are wasting a ton of money and we should stop wasting money. Right? There are many ways to waste less. Right? One is just to cut the budget overall. Another one is to say we're reducing taxpayer support and raising tuition. Another one is to say we are going to defund certain departments that we think are especially wasteful. So you might say we're going to keep funding science and technology, but we are going to cut, cut, uh, we are going to cut spending for history, English literature, women's studies, and so on. So these are all ideas that I think that are, that are worth considering. I mean, my views is like, yeah, let's do them all. Let's do them all. There's so many ways to cut. We need to explore cutting. We need to be creative and curious about the best way to cut. Right? Because right now there is so little curiosity about cutting. Almost everyone just thinks about either spending more or spending better. Right? Spending better is a good question, but it's not nearly as good as spending less. Spending less is an idea that is common sense. Once you admit that a lot of money is being wasted, just why would you not just immediately cut? Again, like, to, to repeat, um, like the, the best path is always to say, look, are there some things we can agree are a waste? Yes. Then let's stop the conversation and cut them right now. Then we can have a long and involved conversation over the course of the next five or ten years about how to spend the money better. Why? Well, figuring out how to spend money well is very hard. Figuring out how to not waste money is very easy. I say it's very similar to if you were a government department of astrology. <laughs> All right, once we agree, as I hope you do, that astrology is a waste of money and does not work, the immediate thing to do is say we are closing that department and we will stop spending money on astrology. And someone says, well, what will we spend money? We'll figure that out later. We'll figure that out later. That's not the most important thing. The important thing is to immediately cut wasteful spending. Then we can have a conversation about how to spend it better, and maybe we just don't know. If we don't know, then we just wait and see. In the same way that if you are thinking about spending your own money, you will often look at your options online and then say, eh, none of these seem that good, I'll just keep my money and wait. Because my son was planning on spending Christmas money on the new computer last December, but when he actually looked at the options, he said, eh, I don't like any of these very much, I'll wait. And I said, that's my boy, that's my boy, good boy. Yes, the money will not burn a hole in your pocket if you just keep it. In fact, I give my kids 5% interest on their money that they don't spend. With the bank of dad, the bank of dad, and you have 5% interest, yeah, that's it's pretty good, right? But unfortunately, only my kids can get that 5% interest rate. <laughs> All right, now, the other thing that I do say is to switch money over to vocational education. Right, which I think is really undervalued. I got many emails from teachers of vocational education in America who say, you know, I'm so frustrated. I'm the only teacher in my entire school that actually teaches kids that do not like school. I'm the only one preparing them for their future outside of jail. And when I retire, they're going to cancel my program. And this is a crazy way to allocate money. These are some of the best programs that are offered programs in technical skills and crafts, which uh, I go into my book in detail, have a lot of them you know, are very well justified. At least they're much better than what we usually have. Now, there are a lot of other ideas about how to improve school, which I agree with. Uh, I try to focus on things where my view is unusual. Yeah, so like, I'm strongly in favor of ending political brainwashing in American schools, and uh, this has gotten very bad in the last year. 
right? So if you see it on the news or social media, yeah, for me it used to only be on the news or social media, but then actually kids started coming home from school and saying, Dad, this is what they're telling us. Also, you know, like brainwashing on the job has gotten bad in the last year, where like a, just a regular worker in a bank has to get a sermon about politics. So, um, you know, it's not like you, it's not, it's not like you're getting put in prison or anything. So, uh, it's not like older people in Slovakia may remember really bad brainwashing, uh, but still. So yeah, there's really a lot to be done. But you know, honestly, like the number one most important thing is to get over our resistance to cutting spending. If it's wasteful, stop wasting the money now. Yes. Is it English or Slovakian? In English. Okay. Don't, don't worry. Okay. Yeah, uh, Lavoski, I just want, don't want to be back for everyone. Uh, I'm Lavoski, uh, Mario coming from EUZ, which is National Union, Union of Air Employers. So we are the sponsor, so I expect this serious answer. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the point is that uh, we as uh, employers finally find out that the education system is not working well. Yeah, we find it out only lately, uh, but uh, still better than never. And uh, we are quite much interfering into the education system. We recognize most of what you have said. And we also see that there are clear answers to that. And uh, all the education, academia, the system tell us uh, don't care, don't bother us, we know better. You know best what to do, and you will just uh, pay money, uh, taxes, and, and, and so on. Yeah. So it's the what, same in America. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm quite glad that not only us we have these problems. So, but still can be improved. So, what to do to change this all? Because we really see that uh, the academia is living in their own entire world. We are kind of satellite around, paying for this fun and receiving worse and worse prepared uh, uh, results. I mean, outcome of the education system is, come, is getting worse and worse. And we really didn't find uh, support from, uh, partly from the government. We see the similarities in the US. Yeah, so what to do? Shall we close the academia at all and take it over? So, but I would, I think other guys are responsive. We are responsible for doing business. We are not here to teach kids. Uh, I have three kids, so I know what, to do, what, what does it mean. So we pay teachers, and they, they, they deliver fake, mostly. So what to do? Because we really don't know what to do. We will have uh, the new law for uh, universities next week in Parliament, and we are really afraid of it. It goes through, not maybe, maybe hopefully, yes, the government is here. <laughs> so what to do? Yeah, so give us five, four, six uh, real arguments of what to do. First, you, uh, you should give yourself more credit. Business already does most of the real job training, which happens on the job. The way that I've explained my book in a, in a short sentence is, many people think that education is job training. Really, education is like a passport to the real training which happens on the job. The actual training, the way that people learn how to do things is normally by doing, not by getting a lecture from someone who's never done the job. So that's the first thing, is just to realize that business is already actually the mo perhaps the most important part of the education system, it's just you get no credit and no money for it. But I can give you the credit anyway. I, can't give you the, I don't have the money to give you. Um, what else can be done? So. As Robert was saying, the first thing, honestly, is just admitting that we have a problem, admitting that the solution is not just spending more money, admitting that you get very that uh, you get very poor value for every euro that you spend, right? Because as long as education is sacred, as long as it's like criticizing the Pope, then you can there can be no progress. You need to be honest and just say, look, we are wasting a lot of money. It's wishful thinking. It sounds good, but it works poorly. But now, now, the way to do that, I admit that it's hard. I have spent a lot of my life trying to figure out how to make unpleasant truths acceptable. Uh, in a way, when I was teaching my own kids, when they were six, they, they would say, you know, like they, were, they were playing a video game called Tropico. And in Tropico, the communists, there's actually a communist party on the, on the, in this game, they always say, you know, you know El Presidente, the people need more food, the people need housing, give them this stuff. And my son, when they were six, said, Look, you've always been telling us how terrible the communists are. And my wife uh, you know, escaped from communist Romania when she was six. And yet, 
in the game, the communists seem very nice, so what's going on? And I thought about it, and I said, well, son, here's the problem. In the real world, there are many things that sound good, but are bad. And there are many things that, or that, or that, there are many things that, that, uh, that, uh, that are the opposite. Uh, that said that said so that um, let's see, was you know, so many many things that sound good but are bad. There are many things that sound bad but are good. Giving everybody everything they need sounds good. It works very bad, as the older people here know, and I hope the younger people here have heard. All right, you know, it is much better to do something that sounds bad, which is say yes. Like if you want to get good things in life, you have to work for them. Doesn't sound as good, but it works very well. Um, a lot of what you need to do to improve policies is just to confront this and say, look, just spending more money on school sounds really good, but it doesn't work well. Much better would be to be honest, to admit that we're wasting a lot of money, and then to focus on getting people through school sooner and getting them into the real world at a younger age. Right? Now, some of the things that I think are easier to sell to a general audience are defunding the departments that are not science and technology. So STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, almost all normal people in their bones know these are real subjects that have real use. Even there, when you talk to people, they'll say, yeah, well, we did a lot of set theory. That's not very useful. You can't build a bridge with set theory. Uh, but even so, compared to other disciplines, they really are teaching a lot of useful material. So a system where you especially cut funding for other majors, and then say, well, if you don't want to study STEM, then go get a job. Those are your options, right? Or you could go and pay for it, some, some, pay for it yourself if you really want to. You know, if you want to go and pay 10,000 euros a year to study history, great, feel free. Just don't expect Slovakian taxpayers to pay for it. Um, now, again, in terms of how to best make this acceptable to the average Slovakian, I mean, you know it much better than I do. Uh, but again, that's where I would start would be things like saying we are going to cut funding for things that are not STEM because these things are really just joke fields anyway and are not very useful and are basically just a way to hide from life. And we want to encourage people to, to greet life. Don't hide from life. Say hello, life. I want to be part of it. That would be a better attitude. Uh, in terms of other areas to improve, Let's see, so does Slovakia still rely heavily on standardized testing? Yes, yeah, so that's one thing where you're better than us. America is moving away from standardized testing, claiming falsely that it is racist and evil. Right? It really is a very good way of measuring results and finding out whether people are actually learning or not. But given how little schools teach, you can understand why they don't want to measure what's happening. Because, well, the measurements say students hardly learn anything. Oh well, sorry. Uh, well, you don't get your money back anyway. Yeah, so right now, in American um, American uh, you know, education for uh, for K through 12, kindergarten through 12th grade, we are now up to spending twenty thousand dollars per year. It's so eighteen thousand dollars, eighteen thousand euros per student per year. Right? Crazy. I mean, even if they were getting a great education, that would be crazy. But what they're getting is so poor, and yet the money keeps flowing because people don't want to admit the ugly truth. Let's see, other requests. Hello. Hello. Um, good evening, and thank you very much for the talk. <laughs> um, I have three questions. I hope it's okay. Um, right. I'll try to remember all three. <laughs> okay. So the first question is: um, So when you're speaking about um, cutting costs of the education, um, so in the U.S. it works that it's privately funded, at least in my understanding. The, the students pay for their education. So uh, I'm not sure exactly the incentives work here. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer is that most American students only pay a small fraction of their college. K through 12 is free. Uh, private schools you have to pay, and the most expensive ones are very expensive. Although even those have a lot of scholarship money, so very few people pay anything close to full price at Harvard. But public universities, what they do is they, it's very subsidized. So you do have to pay something, but it's much less than the full cost. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, the second question is, um, so I heard um, about this thing, um, the people, I, I've heard a lot of uh, educational reform and everything, and, and um, they never said this important thing, which is called a um, spaced repetition memory. Um, so, so it's a technique that, you know, you can remember forever lots of things. And there's literally, like, zero institution that talk about this. And 
even like the best institutions like MIT or Stanford, they don't even mention that. They don't even mention that, oh, there is this technique. If you use it, you're really going to get, uh, remember a lot of things. Um, um, so that, that's just weird because it's one of the things that ha in our existence has no diminishing returns. It's really, really few of those things. And, um, and the, the last question is, um, is there any institution that we can just follow from the day one, like from tomorrow? Look at this institution. This institution has already solved all, all problems. It knows how to fund, um, you know, is there, is there an institution that already solved everything we can just follow from tomorrow? Thank you. All right. So your first question is, I believe, what educational psychologists call interleaving. And you're correct, it is a much better way of getting long-term memory. The normal way that we teach in school is we say, here's all the material, here's a test, and everything depends upon your performance in that test, and afterwards we never talk about the subject again. You get much better retention if you <laughs> teach for a while, give a, give a test, then wait for a while, then teach the material again and give another test, then wait for a while and teach it again. Uh, so the, uh, that, is a, that is a better technique, uh, that is experimentally confirmed. Again, the problem is that it requires the teachers actually make an effort. It requires that they go back and teach things they've already taught, which is kind of boring for teachers. It requires the teachers in different grades and classes coordinate with each other. Right? It diminishes the role of the teacher as the artist. Right? And this is a, a very good way to understand the way that American professors see themselves. American professors, they're not craftsmen, they're artists. You can't tell an artist what to draw. Only he knows what should be drawn. And you can't criticize him. Only he knows what he's trying to do. So this is the way that American college classes normally work, is that every professor can decide whatever he thinks is best. But you know, as a professor, I enjoy this a lot. Uh, but yes, it's not a good way to actually get good student learning. Uh, so is there any great existing system in the world? Uh, no. There's no great existing system in the world. Um, of course, there are countries that, just, that are just very poor, and so they spend very little on education. Uh, I wouldn't point to them because they're poor because they have a bunch of other problems. So I don't think they're, really, they're, really, they're not really a good model of anything. It's more of someone who's burned down his house and then he doesn't have any problems with electricity anymore. It's like, well, yeah, because your house is burned down. That's why you, your electricity doesn't ever have any problems, because your electricity doesn't work at all. Um, I mean, in terms of the, the best systems, I do think that the vocational education system, especially Switzerland, is probably the best for vocational education specifically. Um, my understanding is the Germans are moving in an American direction and gradually de-emphasizing vocational education, but the Swiss are standing firm for now. So that is, I think, the better attitude, just to realize just this is something that America does very poorly on and other countries do better on. Um, let's see, but, I mean, for higher education, yeah, I mean, there's any that I really consider especially good. I mean, honestly, like most countries are trying to move in the U.S. direction. Well, I say, no, the U.S. direction is terrible. It's a great way to waste a pile of money, right? It's a great way to go and make life wonderful for, for professors. Right, you know, just to be clear, like, you know, the system has been very good to me. I'm not complaining because I'm bitter. I mean, I'm complaining, I'm, I'm, I'm what we call a whistleblower. Like someone who says, yes, uh, I'm inside the system and it's a terrible and it's great for me, but just want you to know that you're being ripped off. Uh, hello, hi, my name is Marek, and I'm ashamed to say that I have one of those useless degrees. <laughs> it's actually a business degree. <laughs> and so, so my question is that um, if the system is so broken, which I happen to agree with, how long can it actually sustain itself like this? And what, in your opinion, would be the breaking point? Great question. Uh, but the unfortunate answer is, as long as it's funded by taxpayers, it can be sustained indefinitely. There is a world of difference between record companies facing online competition and traditional school facing online competition. If traditional record companies lose their customers, guess what happens to them? They have no money and they go out of business. If traditional schools find that they you know, if traditional schools find that people are unhappy, what happens? Nothing because they get the money from taxpayers, not from customers. That's the fundamental problem of the system, is that even if there was a much better way of teaching online, still, as long as schools are receiving, in America, $20,000 per year per student, 
Why should they change anything? Why should they change anything? Now you might think, well, won't eventually taxpayers realize they're getting ripped off and then cut <clears throat> funding? I was hoping this would happen during COVID. Right, so during COVID, in many parts of America, including mine, the schools closed for over a year. The schools took all the usual money and then didn't do their job, which is, of course, primarily providing daycare. Right? The education is specula speculation. Who knows whether it's happening? The daycare is real. Daycare definitely happens. You definitely could take your kid in America, send him to school, and you don't have to worry about him for the rest of the day. Schools for many years, for over a year, stopped providing daycare. Parents were generally unhappy, but this did not lead schools to losing funding. In fact, they got a large increase in funding. It's a crazy system, right? So, I mean, if, if it was ever going to happen, I think it would, happen, it would have happened during COVID, but it did not happen, right? You might think people would say, yeah, well, how about we, uh, you know, we have, so we have, we, you know, like we should take money away from public schools and give it to, uh, you know, and have a school choice program. It is true there are a number of states that are moving in the direction of school choice in the United States, which at minimum would have been much better during COVID because in America, private, private K-12 schools almost always remain open because American parents do not want to pay many thousands of dollars for Zoom school. Public schools being free, people just took what they got and tough luck. So yeah, I mean, I wish that it was like other parts of the economy but where competitive pressure would force reform. But as long as you're being funded by tax, by tax dollars, why should you ever expect things to improve? Let's see, uh, yes, please. Hey, so my name is Jake Publifu. Um, my question is, um, in order to track the progress of the educational system, we need to have a ranking of a system uh, or an objective, let's say. So if we rank the system at time t0, then at some other time t, we see the difference and we see whether we improve or not. So my question is, uh, which ranking function would you use for the entire educational system? Um, yeah, is it like GDP of the country? Is it uh, more like uh, how many uh, graduates find jobs in their respective fields that they're studied? Or which function do you propose? And then also ranking function regarding <coughs> universities. Do you agree with the existing rankings, or would you su suggest or propose some better ranking? Thank you. Right. This is a huge issue in education research. Probably the best method that we have right now of measuring the performance of a school or a teacher is what's called value-added measures. This is where you basically give students a test at the beginning of the year and the end of the year and see how much they improved. And in principle, you could actually measure how good a teacher was. Because normally teachers will say, it's not fair that if I, I'm given students who are behind and I do really well with them, and I bring them up to the average, you say that I didn't have good performance. So the idea of these measures is to go and compensate people for starting with students that are more or less advanced at the beginning. Uh, that is reasonable, although again, it doesn't really answer this question of retention of memory. Right? So for that, you would have to actually go back and measure years later. Uh, when people have done this, what they found is that even very good teachers do not seem to actually cause, uh, cause long-term learning. They basically have end-of-the-year test results better, but three years later, those students have forgotten the extra material that they learned, so they no longer are doing better. Uh, in terms of just measuring the total amount of knowledge, you know, so I think that you know, true, very traditional, old-fashioned tests like the SAT are quite good. Uh, of course, people hate them because they're good. Because, you know, they say, you know, you have the expression killing the messenger. Killing the messenger, someone says, oh, great one, we've lost the battle. Like, Kill that guy. And it's like, oh, I'm like, I didn't cause us to lose the battle. I'm just telling you what happened. You know, similarly, people feel very negative about standardized tests because they often will say some students are doing poorly. And well, the test is bad then because the students are doing great. How do you know? because I taught them and I'm great. So it must have all worked out. Let's see, in terms of like other measures before you, you were proposing, GDP, you know, there, there definitely is a lot of research trying to find out what is the effect of greater education on GDP. And as I explained in my book, usually actually the, uh, it's hard to find much effect. Now one explanation of this could just be that schools don't teach very much and that's why if the schools did better, 
then you would get these effects. Uh, there's a very famous American education researcher named Eric Kanyashek who claims that if you could just actually raise countries' math and science scores a lot, you could have incredible results. I'm skeptical of this because most jobs use very little math and no science. So how could improving math and science scores really work that well? But that is another idea. Uh, let's see. Like in terms of so you know, that, so I, I will just say you know, these are a lot of different methods that people are using. Um, they're better than nothing. None of them are so far really that compelling. But uh, you know, people are thinking about it. Then you had a second question, I think. Oh, pardon? Universities. Oh yes, yeah, the ranking universities. Uh, yes, so there's a famous survey where they asked people to rank the Pennsylvania State University Law School, and it came out at like 40th in the country. It's funny because the school does not exist. Pennsylvania State University does not have a law school. So how did law professors decide that it was ranked 40 if it doesn't exist? And really said, well, I don't know, it's like a pretty good school, I guess they'll have a pretty good law school. I've never heard of it, but I haven't heard that it's bad, I guess it's 40. That was about what they did. So this, this is one of the ways that people have ranked schools. The most important ranking for American students is the U.S. News and World Report ranking. This is a deliberately secret formula, although there actually are industries of people dedicated to reverse engineering the formula in order to raise the rankings. Uh, my, uh, the law school, my own school, GMU Law, I heard that they got some good econometricians so and they figured out what they had to do to get the ranking up and then they just poured resources into the fairly arbitrary things that got a lot of weight and they raised the ranking. Um, so I mean, honestly, I would say probably the best measure would just be average SAT scores or something like that. Uh, now they are putting in many other measures. Actually, commonly in the measure is just spending. So you can get a good ranking just because you spend a lot of money. That's a bad way to measure quality, is just with the total amount of money that you're spending. Mm -hmm. you know, like maybe you're wasting it, maybe you're wasting it. Um, you know, I will, will say that you know, like if you go and talk to students at top schools in America, while the rankings are far from perfect still, you will definitely see that students at top schools are a lot better. Um, at least in terms of their ability to learn. Although there's almost no schools in America where I will say that most of the students are curious or intellectually alive. The one school where I, where I say it really stands out is the University, of, the University of Chicago. There are many legends about how great their students are, and from what I've seen, the legends are true. When I spoke to the University of Chicago, I, we did a three-hour talk on education, starting at 9 p.m. and going until midnight. There was a break in the middle, and all the students came back. I was like, oh my god, you're curious. You actually want to learn here. Right, you know, other schools that I tell that I that I give talks to, students usually only show up to get extra credit for their class, and then as soon as they have a chance to leave, they leave. But University of Chicago students are indeed very curious. Well, I would say, you know, like at every school, if you look, you can find students that are good. It's just a matter of how hard you have to search. Uh, yes, you know, so for all the negative things that I say about education, there are definitely some positive things that I could say, like. No matter how low ranked your school is, there are probably some amazing professors there who love their subject, know a lot about their subject, and would love to teach you. It's just a matter of finding them. So if you, if you make the effort to find these, find these teachers, they are there. You can learn an enormous amount from them. Right? You know, like just because it's a low ranked school, often it's just someone who's like, I love history so much, I'd rather teach at Northern Virginia Community College than have a regular job. If anyone shows up in my office and wants to talk about history, it's the happiest day of the year for me. So yeah, try to find those people and get a lot out of it. It can be done. Uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your thank uh, you. lecture. It was very interesting. Uh, actually, I have my own uh, theory about uh, the topic, and uh, you can tell me right. where you agree and where you disagree. Uh, and my theory is based on thinking about the student or the graduate of the student as the piece of hardware. You know, if I am a company or employer, of course I use, use a lot of hardware, mm -hmm. but uh, let's say where I have my mobile phone. So I have my mobile phone. Yeah? The mobile phone is the student or, or the graduate or my employee. So what is interesting on the mobile phone on the student? Why it is useful for me? Because it has some applications 
that are useful for me. But the whole debate about the education is, in my view, missing this very important distinction that if I will buy this Samsung from the company, I don't expect that the producer of the software uh, hardware will be uh, developing all necessary applications that will be useful for me. And I have maybe way too many applications in my mobile phone, it's maybe 100 applications. But there are many, many companies that are designing their or developing the applications I can buy. So I can train the students for very specific uh, function I will need in my company and I don't expect the school and it is beyond the uh, possibility of any school to equip the student with this specific skill. So I would say our criticism of the schools is based on the wrong expectations. What I'm expecting from the producer of the mobile phone from Samsung is that it will equip that piece of hardware with the good operating system that will allow any application will run smoothly and efficiently. And I believe that the role of the school is not to de develop applications, it is to provide students with the very good operating system. And what is the operating system of the student? Well, that's these basics you have mentioned, meaning to have the student that is able to read, to write, to do math, uh, and the, the whole area of these so-called soft skills, meaning ability to learn, to be flexible, etc., etc. So, what do you think about this, thinking about the student as a sort of uh, operating system and applications? Because I think that's very important to see what the schools can do and what are they, you know, it, it is impossible or it is not realistic to expect that they will do that? Yeah, that is, so that, that is a great question. In the United States, we often talk about learning how to learn or learning how to think or teaching critical thinking skills. Um, this is the classic answer for any teacher who teaches an impractical subject. You go to the history teacher and you say, well, will I use history in real life? As well, you won't learn history, but I've taught you how to think. And now you will go forth able to solve any problem that you might face. Um, it's a nice idea. The question is, is it really true? Or is it just wishful thinking? Well, there's a whole field called educational psychology where they've been researching this question for about 100 years. Uh, they call it transfer of learning. It all started with a psychologist named Thorndike who heard many times that Latin builds the mind. Latin is the uniquely logical language that builds the mind. So we did some early experiments to see, is it really true that if you learn Latin, this then improves your ability to learn other things. And he discovered, no, it doesn't. Latin is, does not go and improve things. Latin does not transform the hardware of the student. Now since then, there's been a lot of other research on this, which I trust because the researchers very desperately want to find learning how to learn, learning how to think, critical thinking, and yet they find very little evidence of it. Really, the main lesson of this field is that Learning is highly specific. Basically, the hardware is what the student arrives with. It's very hard to have any effect on the hardware. If you do a good job, you, you download a few, you give them a few apps. That's what success is. Right? And you might hope for more, but it seems very hard to actually find it. Now, obviously, in the real world, you can find incredible people who do go and combine knowledge from many different fields and work it together into a new theory. But these people are so rare that we just don't see them in the data. These people are less than one in a thousand, and so they're just hard to locate. And so that, I said, is the main answer I would give, is that it sounds really good, and if you could go and improve the hardware a lot, that would be great. Unfortunately, there's very little evidence that teachers have this power. And furthermore, what's striking is that at least we usually measure whether you learned history. We don't even try to measure whether you learned how to think. Right? So the idea that teachers can fail at teaching the specific content, but they are good at teaching something that we don't even try to measure, it sounds 
phony, right? Uh, another analogy people sometimes use is they say, look, we're trying to, the mind is a muscle. And if you use the mind, then you will have a strong mind that will be capable of doing all sorts of things. Right? In my book, I say that's a great analogy, but it proves the opposite of what you think it proves. Why? Well, have anyone here ever gotten really, uh, worked out of the gym a lot, you've gotten good muscles, and then you stop going? What happens? Do you get to keep your muscles for the rest of your life because you worked hard for a couple months? No, your muscles atrophy and you go back to the way you were before. Right? So while I've been in Europe, I've stopped doing crunch ups. I do every day. If I stop for much longer, I'll have the normal flabby stomach of other Americans. All right. So I say the mind is like that. It's more like, you know, mind is like a muscle. It's one where the things that you, the skills that you practice reliably, you are good at, and everything else that you don't use goes away. Other questions? Other questions? Yes. Hello, sir. Hello. My name is Kamil. Well, first, uh, I would I would like to thank you that, and also the INS that, that they they made efforts to bring such a capacity. Many of your owners to Slovakia, so welcome. And thank you. Thank you, Slovakia. I, I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, thank you. During welcome. COVID, I was super lonely, and no one wanted to listen to me. <laughs> Or you were scared. <laughs> but no. on, on that note, I hope that I can be maybe more personal and bring that back to back to mm -hmm. your personal level. Because one thing that strikes me <coughs> right from the beginning when I see on your on your uh, slide or how to call it that you are a professor, right? Mm -hmm. And you are at a rather renowned university. So so my question would be <coughs> that you personally would you assess with what the state secretary said that. Would you assess yourself as being a professor that creates this operational system in your students? And if yes, what is your personal recipe? You know, and if not, why do you do it? <laughs> this is a very hard question for any professor because we want to believe that we are transforming our students. But there's one little problem. I grade the exams. And when I grade the exams, I discover how poor my ability to actually get students to understand the material is. And, it's, and of course this is not like, according to student evaluations, I'm well above average, but when I actually read what the students, what the students have to say, it's, like, it's almost like you didn't hear anything I said. It's so disappointing. Right? And then even more disappointing is when you meet a good student a few years later and they don't remember what you taught them. Uh, so, now as to why I do it, well, you know, honestly, like a lot of it is just like, it is a great life for me. I would like to do better. I am all, I'm trying to figure out ways of teaching better. And what I can say is, you know, I have a few good students who I really do make a difference for, but I'm not going to claim that I change their operating system. The really good students start with a good operating system. And then I can teach them something because they are so motivated, so smart, so thoughtful. People like that I can improve a lot. Right? And I can even I can make a difference for them, but only because they uh, they they bring so much to the room. Uh, so like I homeschooled my older sons for six years, and I was super grateful because my older sons love economics. So I was able to teach them a lot. Like, but I would, it was not that I had a special way of teaching my sons compared to other people. Rather, it's just that they were so motivated and so interested in learning. Um, I did have a lot more time with them, so that is one, one that is definitely that is probably the one thing that I know that I could do if people actually wanted to, is I could just spend a lot more time teaching. So a lot of the problem is just that the classes are too short, and I would need to have ten times as much time with a student to really make a difference. Uh, if a student actually wanted to come and have lunch with me every day and learn, I would be happy to go and have lunch with them every day. Uh, but it turns out very few students actually care that much. Um, so in terms of why I keep doing it, I mean, honestly, when I'm teaching a class, there are, like, I'm always looking for the few students that actually seem happy to be there, and I talk to them, and I feel good about what I did. Um, that does not mean that I transform them. That's wishful thinking, and I try to avoid that. Um, you know, I've had a few students where I had a big influence on them, but only because they were the kind of students that wanted to be influenced. You know, it's very hard to influence someone who doesn't care, and very hard for a teacher to convince a typical student to be interested in an academic subject. I mean, here honestly, 
Like, even from a fairly young age, I had a lot of lessons in how poor my persuasive abilities really are, because I spent many years trying to get my dad to be interested in ideas. And my dad is very smart, he's a PhD in electrical engineering, but he has no theoretical curiosity at all. At all. So instead he has a number of standard economic views, and if you disagree, he gets angry. And that's all he did, that's what he does. You know, he could get me on, like if we were stuck on an island, he could build a boat. He knows how to do things like that. But, and for many years I said, if only I could just figure out the right words to say to my dad, then he'd be interested in what I have to say. And eventually I realized, no, there are no such words. He is just fundamentally not curious about this kind of thing. So, that's my dad. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And you guys have been great. I really appreciate it.